Hello and welcome to the Draft Digital Spotlight. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre and I'll be your host today. And I am honored to have with me in the virtual studio, Maddie Dalrymple. Maddie, welcome. Thank you, Mark. This is fun to be here. It's great to have you. I am really excited to talk about your mysteries and the mysteries that you write. Can you tell us about the Anne Kinnear novels and uh, this, uh, the other things that you're writing? Sure. So I have two series. My first series was the Anne Kinnear suspense novels. And I always like to issue the caveat that they're not whodunit type mysteries. So people who are looking for that kind of thing, I don't want to mislead them about that. But it is about a woman named Anne Kinnear who has a business sensing spirits. So she is able to, in the first book, sort of sense the demeanor of spirits by colors or scents that she perceives from them. And uh, she and her brother have built up sort of a, a consulting business around this. So I try to treat it in a very straightforward way, in the same way that if someone was offering computer services or accounting services, you know, it's like that. They have engagements, they have contracts, it's all very, very businesslike. And Anne is someone who's not completely comfortable with her ability. You know, it's caused her some problems in her personal life. Uh, but her brother is a big booster. He's her big supporter. So he feels like, you know, she can just get out there and do some good with her ability, then it's going to be uh, good for her financially, but also good for her personally. And so through the course of the two books that are out there, and now the third book that is going to be launching later this year, those are The Sense of Death and The Sense of Reckoning. Anne's abilities increase over time. And you can imagine that because they're suspense novels, they require her to fall into perilous situations as a result <laughs> of what she's doing. Okay. And the first one takes place largely around my home base. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. So the sense of death is very much set in Chester County, Philadelphia, the Jersey Shore, Wilmington, Delaware, kind of my neck of the woods. And then the second Anne Kinnear book is set on Mount Desert Island, Maine, which is where Bar Harbor and Acadia National Park are. And it has as a backstory, a big fire that took place there in 1947 that burned, I think 17,000 acres of the island, burned a lot of the parkland and also burned into Bar Harbor, into what was called Millionaire's Row. So it was at a time after the war when some of these huge cottages that the millionaires had built were sort of becoming um, white elephants for them. And uh, the story of one of those cottages and, um, and an old decrepit hotel is part of that. So if anyone knows Mount Desert Island, the hotel in Mount Desert Island is sort of a rundown version of the Claremont Hotel in Southwest Harbor, Maine, which is where my husband and I spent our honeymoon. It's one of my favorite hotels ever. And I found out from the manager where the best place was to hide a body in the Claremont Hotel. So if you want to know, <laughs> you can read The Sense of Reckoning and find out. So when you ask these really disturbing questions of people when you're traveling or a honeymoon or wherever, do people kind of give you a second glance and, and just, uh, you know, maybe pull out the phone, start dial 9-1 and just wait? Like People are, are surprisingly excited to talk about things like that. Uh, that that story. I mean, the first question I asked the guy wasn't where would you hide a body. We had a lot of other conversation first. I <laughs> like, kind of where, slipped where that in. Get, where can I get a good coffee around here? Or exactly. <laughs> uh, we were guests there at the time, so that helped. But it was funny. The book I'm working on now is very much has an aviation theme. I'm a huge aviation nerd. Uh, my husband's a pilot. I took flying lessons for a while uh, before writing kind of bumped it to the back burner. I actually owned a plane for a while, a 1946 Stinson Voyager. People can go look that up. It was a beautiful plane. Uh, it belongs now to friends of mine who live nearby. So I get probably get to see it in the air more now than I did when I owned it. <laughs> but one of the parts of that novel is about a small local airport, which is based on a small local airport near me. And in the story, there's this question about, is the airport gonna get set, sold to the developers? You know, is it gonna be covered with McMansions? And I needed to find out what the economics of that would be. Like I needed a general sense of how much a property like that would sell for if it's sold to um, a developer. And I put off for a long time calling the manager of the airport to ask him that question. 
because that's <laughs> felt a little awkward. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if I wanted to buy your airport, how much would it cost me? But he was great. You know, I explained the scenario to him and I think he sensed that I was going to be giving a sympathetic portrayal of general aviation. Uh, so we had a great conversation. So people are very generous about talking about their areas of expertise. Oh, that is fantastic. Now, you you mentioned um, um, you mentioned uh, planes and, mm -hmm. and I know that um, um, nautical themes are really, really important to you. Can we uh, can we dip into that, or, or should should I first ask a little bit about the the imprint that you uh, indie published with, and and the legacy uh, in, in your lineage related to the independent spirit? Yeah, actually, before I dive into that, I'll just quickly mention my other series. My other fiction series is the Lizzie Ballard thrillers. So okay. there's a trilogy. There are three of those: Rock, Paper, Scissors, Snakes and Ladders, and The Iron Ring. Similarly, the first one of those, Rock, Paper, Scissors, takes place in my neck of the woods around Philadelphia. The other two have significant portions in my other favorite place to go when I'm away from home, which is Sedona, Arizona. So if people like uh, stories set there, that's a little more action oriented. I sort of position that as a thriller, but uh, the Lizzie Ballard thrillers is my other, um, my other series. And the imprint that I write them under is William Kingsfield Publishers. And that is the name that my father wrote under. My father was a short story writer. And back in the 50s, he had some stories published in Collier's and Cosmopolitan, you know, some pretty prestigious platforms. And he wrote under the name William Kingsfield. And he was always my model. He was the reason that as I was growing up, I wanted to be an author. And I wrote some short stories and college and it was great because I could just turn them over to my dad and he kind of acted as my agent. He would send them out. And so if they got rejected, I never had to hear about it. If they got accepted, <laughs> you know, I got the added girl from dad. Uh, but he's really the person who made becoming an author a dream for me. So kind of as an homage to him, I named my imprint William Kingsfield Publishers. Oh, that is really, really cool. Now, uh, let's go back to Lizzie for just one second. Yep. Is there a paranormal aspect to those ones like the Encineer or, or, or not? There is. It's sort of more Stephen King-esque than ghostly. So both the Ann Kinnear series and the Lizzie Ballard series have the common theme of what happens when an extraordinary ability transforms an ordinary life. And so for Ann Kinnear, her extraordinary ability is her spirit sensing ability. Lizzie has a different kind of extraordinary ability that I can't really say because it would be a bit of a spoiler for the first book. <laughs> it would give it book. away. Okay. It would give it away. <laughs> but I had come up with this idea that I wanted to explore. It didn't really fit into the Anne world. It did have this common theme, but it wasn't quite right for Anne. But one thing that's different about the two of them is that the two characters respond very differently to their extraordinary abilities. So Anne, as we talked about, sort of withdraws. She has this very tight circle of people that she feels safe with, her brother, her brother's husband, the pilot that she uses to take her to engagements up and down the East Coast, his pilot wife. again, right? A pilot again. There always has to be <laughs> had some aviation thing going on. And so she has this ability that would shouldn't keep her from getting out there in the world and interacting with people. And yet she feels very uncomfortable with it. And she's created this insular community for herself. Lizzie, on the other hand, the Lizzie Ballard stories start out when Lizzie's very young, little girl. Most of the book takes place when Lizzie is 16 and 17. And Lizzie is someone who, based on her ability, should really be staying home. She should really be self-quarantining. <laughs> but Lizzie loves people and she loves to reach out and form connections with people. And, you know, she does that and bad things happen. And so it was very interesting to look at this common theme, but with two characters who are really reacting to it in very different ways. That's cool. Um, I have to pop up this comment from Lisa who says that the Lizzie Ballard ah, tours are amazing. <laughs> so. Lisa, thank you. That's uh, Lisa Reagan who writes the Josie Quinn uh Detective oh. Josie Quinn series. So it is oh, awesome. even more exciting to hear that from Lisa than, than it might Fantastic. otherwise be. So uh, the difference then with uh, Lizzie um, and Anne is, I guess you get an opportunity when an idea comes into your head, the idea can potentially apply better to one character situation than another. Is that true? It is. The Anne Kinnear series, I think of as sort of my flagship series. And I think that's going to go on forever. There's always a way that you can take dead people 
and make them suspenseful. So that's sort of easy. Uh, the Lizzie books are currently the three are a trilogy. It's one story arc. And I've sort of set Lizzie aside for the time being, but I can imagine maybe coming back to Lizzie later and doing another trilogy, but when Lizzie was older, because okay. I think there are things you can do with a character who's an adult that you really don't want to do with a character when they're a small child or a teenager. So I can imagine maybe getting a little grittier when Lizzie is older. And I also think that because of her ability, she has some difficult moral decisions to make. And the moral decisions are a little bit easier for her to make and for the reader to understand when she's young. But I think it would be a whole different set of questions that she would have to ask herself and that the readers would be asking if she were older. So uh, yeah, for the time being, I'm going to be sticking with the, the ghostly suspense, but I may get back to Lizzie later. Excellent, excellent. Now, I, I want to transition into talking about the indie author, which is uh, mm -hmm. a, a brand of yours that uh, you share, a, a podcast and website. But I did see something because you mentioned quarantine. And, and, and I saw you post through the, through the, um, the indie author Facebook group uh, a, a note about a story you're working on now. And you modified the term handshake into they shared a greeting. Is that is it? Did I get that right? Yeah, I was working on re, you know, working over revising a scene I had already written that I'd written months ago. And the three people are talking. It's a it's Anne and her brother Mike and a client. And they get up and they finish their business. And then I had they, them shaking hands. And I got to that and I just thought, is that gonna sort of take people out of the story? I find myself, even if I watch completely innocuous movies that were that were filmed years ago and see people standing close together. I'm like, too close, too close. <laughs> and so it takes me out of it a little bit. And I don't want it to be about COVID or about the virus. It's not that, it's just, will the idea of people shaking hands in a year, will that still seem weird or will that be fine? Right. So yeah, I think I said, um, they stood and exchanged pleasantries and then he left. So that can be anything people want, but it is, it's, an awkward situation to deal with. It's kind of like when cell phones became ubiquitous and people weren't really on the phone, you know, on a landline phone. And it took away a whole bunch of language that writers can use. Like she right. slammed down the phone or she, yeah. you know, dialed the number. And, or hey, it's your um, dime. <laughs> or hey, it's your dime. Or, or, you know, just that language that you use, you could almost use the phone as a, as a prop to express, you know, saying, she clicked decline, just doesn't have the same sort of, uh, you know, she clicked end, doesn't have the same sort of impact as she slammed the phone down on the receiver. So I think it's gonna be the same, even if you're not writing about the the uh, pandemic, there's still gonna be things you have to consider how you present them in your books. That's interesting, I find that fascinating. Now we talked about that, and you'd share that through the indie author. Can you explain what the indie author is? Sure. So the Indie Author is my nonfiction platform. And I have a podcast called The Indie Author, which is largely focused on topics that I think would be of interest to authors. But uh, occasionally, I do share out on my Maddie Dalrymple platform episodes that I think have more general applicability. For example, um, our mutual friend, Zach Bohannon, has been doing this experiment of digital minimalism, right. which was a challenging podcast to do because I have trouble saying digital minimalism. But that one, the things we talked about were really applicable to anyone. So we cover a variety of topics on the podcast. I have a website, The Indie Author, with resources for authors. And that kind of gets back to the question you had asked earlier about the nautical theme. Yeah, you can probably yeah. see if they're, if they're watching on video. I have some nautical maps behind me. This one is is Mount Desert Island. And this one is Charleston, my other favorite place to go. <laughs> and I, I came up with that, the nautical theme, because years and years ago, I was in a writer's group meeting that was largely facilitated by traditionally published authors. And it was largely for novice authors who were looking to break into the traditional publishing world. And I showed up and I was kind of like the token indie person. I don't know that it would be like this anymore because this was like a number of years ago. Yeah. 
but people were asking me questions, you know, like I was a Martian um, and, you know, had landed on earth. And someone said, how do you know when a book is done? If you're not relying on an editor to give you the go ahead, how do you know? And we had some conversation about that. And then another woman there said, well, I figure that my book is done when it's about 60%. It said about 60%. And I was like, that's horrifying. It's <laughs> just horrifying. <laughs> like, why would you ask someone to read a book that was at 60%? That's kind of inexcusable. And I, you know, mulled on that for a while. And I realized that it's kind of like sending a person out on a voyage in a boat that's like 60% watertight. You know, you would <laughs> never do that. And the more I thought about it, and then, and so the extension to me was that the way I write, to me, it's not like some kind of artistic woo woo, the muse descends. It's craftsmanlike. And um, my husband and I were at a, um, a charity event in Maine, and one of the people had donated this beautiful hand built dory. And I thought that is what I want to use as a metaphor for my writing. It's it's lovely, it's watertight, it will get you from point A to B. Um, it's craftsmanlike. And every time I thought of something about the writing or publishing world, there was always a great nautical analogy, uh, as in taking the short tack. So, um, I know you're shy about talking about this, but you and I had published a book earlier in the year, Taking the Short Tack, about creating income and connecting with readers using short fiction. And there were all sorts of great analogies for why the short tack, which is a method you would use if you were navigating in a narrow waterway or if your engine went out, um, all sorts of ways where that was a great analogy for what you can do with short fiction. So it's just endless. I have a whole draft of concepts I want to share with people about ways they can take the learnings and the concepts of um, boat building, boat navigation, and apply them to indie publishing and traditional I, publishing too. Well, I love, I mean, in, in the Taking the Short Tank, you actually use imagery on the cover. You had your designer use imagery, mm -hmm. uh, nautical imagery, and then and then even the, the short tank itself, yeah, which, uh, and you had to explain it to me <laughs> what that meant in terms yeah. of, of maneuvering your uh, maneuvering your boat. Uh, I could, because again, I, I I the only thing I know about uh, about boats is is that's where you catch fish from because I grew up with a fisherman, <laughs> but not uh, you're not, on the, reeling on the in the ideas. The ideas are around you as an <laughs> author. You're reeling them into your craft. That's right, and you're casting to to to, to find the muse. <laughs> exactly, exactly. See, it works for everything. Oh, that is fantastic. Um, do you you so what are some of the other analogies that you've used uh, with nautical in either uh, taking the short tack or some of the other um, articles and things that you've written and shared? Let's see. There is uh, the whole concept of owing your reader a solid craft. Okay. And um, the idea of forming a fleet. So that's another idea I'm kicking around as a possible book that you find those other people that share a common destination and you form a fleet with them so you can support each other. Um, there are all sorts of ideas related to the craft. So another one that I'm thinking about is when you're working on a draft, well, when I was working on a draft, I won't generalize my, behind myself, but I would I would write the first chapter and then I would go back and revise the first chapter, revise, revise, revise. I would have a perfect first chapter and then I would move on to the second chapter. At this point, you know, maybe weeks had gone by and I would work, start working on the second chapter. Then I realized that there were some problems with the first chapter and I had to go back and kind of rip them apart and start over again. It was very inefficient way of getting writing done. And I thought if you're building a boat and I'm not going to get the terminology right here, so I apologize, but you would create the structure of the boat. You would put, you know, put the ribs on, you'd have the keel and you would make sure that that was good first. And then you would start layering on the, the hull and you would keep going over the whole boat over and over again, adding refinements, adding structure and then adding refinements until you had 
a beautiful craftsmanlike seaworthy vessel. And that would be your, your craft. That would be your vessel. That would be your book. And at some point you would get to the point where, you know, should I varnish this one more time? Like <laughs> there's something that says, no, you're done. And it's the same with books. At some point you get to a point where are you making it better? Or are you just fiddling with it? And when you're just fiddling with it, then it's time to send it out into the world. You've done all the work you need to do to make it watertight. And so I think that that can help people. You know, you would never build the first 20th of the boat <laughs> completely <laughs> and then move on to the second 20th of the boat, which I think what, is what a lot of what I was doing as a writer. Because you, you could start out thinking, I want a racing sailboat. And then you get to the second 20th and say, no, I really need a tugboat. Now I have to go ditch the first 20th, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. The analogies are, are phenomenal. They, they really, yeah. um, they're, they're, they're watertight, actually. They're watertight. Nice, <laughs> okay. nice. Well, it was funny when you were saying that, it was like, so the, the way you know your manuscript is done, uh, that it's been varnished enough times, is when you hold the manuscript up and you can actually see your reflection in the pages, then you know <laughs> it's got enough polish on it, right? That's right. That's right. Or you're just deciding, I don't want the ore to be blue. I want it to be green. Well, you know, it's fine. It's fine yeah. the way it is. That'll be okay. So I want to go back to uh, the origin of taking the short tack. Um, not trying not to be self promotional in any way. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Icky. But, uh, but this is about you writing the book. And the book came about because I think a, a valuable lesson for writers is um, the ask. And, and, and I have a couple examples of you being brave and strong and asking uh, and, uh, and actually getting. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah. Well, I had written, a, a, I think at the time it was five short stories that were based on the Ann Kinnear characters, the Ann Kinnear suspense shorts. And I had started them because I wrote the first Ann Kinnear novel, which was The Sense of Death. And then I wrote the second one, which was The Sense of Reckoning. And I started working on the third one. And then I had this idea that didn't really work for Ann. So I detoured to Lizzie and I wrote Rock, Paper, Scissors, assuring the Ann fans that I would be back to Ann as soon as Rock, Paper, Scissors was done. And then I thought of the follow on to Rock, Paper, Scissors, which was Snakes and Ladders. And I started in on that still assuring the Ann fans that as soon as I was done with the second one, I'd be back to Ann. And then I had the idea for the third one. I realized it was a trilogy. <laughs> so at that point, I kind of felt like I owed them something. And I started writing short stories that were based on the, um, on the Ann Kinner characters. And I was, I still am selling them as standalone eBooks on Amazon and the other retail platforms. I reserved one of them for my, as a magnet for my email newsletter as everyone will advise one to do. And then I wasn't sure what to, what else I could do with them. And I was listening to your wonderful podcast, Dark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. And you had just mentioned in passing that uh, something about short fiction. And so I dropped you a note and I said, hey, I would love to hear an episode that was devoted to what you can do with short fiction. And so you being the gracious guy you are, you did that episode. I think it was called uh, 10 ways you can make money with your short fiction, but because you're an overachiever, you gave us 13. <laughs> and then I got in touch with you again. And I said, I think that there's enough here for a book. Would you be interested in co-authoring a book with me? And I was thrilled, thrilled when you said that you would be willing to do that. And I think it turned out to be a great partnership because we were bringing very different experiences. I mean, you had far more experience in things you could do with short fiction than I did. You had far more experience in the traditional publishing because I'd gotten like three stories published in college and my dad mediated it all for me. So <laughs> what did I know? And I had this experience with the, you know, as you did too, but at least I could bring my expertise in publishing them as short stories. And then the other thing that I really liked about that collaboration is um, I think it really showed that I came from several decades of being a corporate project manager. And I was like, Timeline, baby. <laughs> Goals, schedule. Spreadsheets and, and, tra and project tracking. Whereas project I, was, tracking. I was just all blue sky and throwing ideas all over the place. And you were you were basically reeling everything in. You were making sure everything was in its proper hold. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. I'm going to write all this down. But it's true. In a lot of cases, you were the idea guy. 
and I was the uh, doer. You know, there was the dreamers and the doers. There's yeah. that kind of thing. And, you know, you brought some ideas that I would never have thought of. And then the other thing I thought was very nice is you're also such a people person and you were always all about the interactions, the interpersonal work, how you could do to support each other. I was like, yeah, but how can you make money on it? Um, <laughs> so I think that between the two of us, we really sort of covered the spectrum and covered right. the different perspectives people could bring. So that was that was really, really exciting. Yeah, I love that balance, right? When you get two people collaborating on something that they're each bringing uh, their strengths yeah, and, and and again, I mean, as a perfect example, completely admitting my weakness of being completely uh, disorganized and, and more of the, the flighty chasing <laughs> of the views around the room. Whereas uh, you have these uh, structured meetings and, and here's what we're going to go through. We're going to go through this point and this point and this point. We're going to update the spreadsheets and stuff. And you kept track of all that stuff and kept us on track. And I think I think. Uh, it's a much better project than had it been uh, something I did on my own or that you had done on your own because we each brought a uh, unique uh, value proposition to it, which I think is the the benefit of of collaboration, right? Is, yeah. is drawing upon all of those unique strengths. Yep. And the other thing that made it successful is that you were willing to accept the project management part and I was willing to accept the new ideas that you brought. So it's each person bringing their strengths and each person accepting the strengths of the other person and taking advantage of it. Yeah. I'm positive there's a nautical metaphor there. I just have to think about it for a minute. Well, do you think there's the navigator and the captain or, or there's the, there's the, the lookout, there's the. <laughs> yeah. And the fact, pardon me, the fact that those roles change sometimes. Whoops. Yeah. Excuse me. This is the downside of having a um, adjustable height desk that if I'm not careful, I, I make it go up and down while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> like rising tides that will float all boats, right? Well, that is one of my favorite, favorite nautical metaphors for the writing world, because I think that there are two types of philosophies in the writing world. One is that it's a zero sum game yeah. and a book that, you know, if you sell your book to someone, it's somebody I could have sold my book to, you know, a book sale to someone else means not a book sale to me. And that's one mindset. And then there's the rising tide raises all ships mindset, which is that being supportive of your fellow authors, it it creates good karma and it comes back to you in good ways. And uh, yeah, I, I either have in draft or I have on my website a blog post about that concept that your author career is going to be more successful if you bring to it the rising tide raises all boats philosophy. That is cool. Now, I want to go back to the fact that you reached out and asked, hey, could you do a podcast episode on this topic? Because there was something you wanted to learn. And I was like, hey, great idea. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And then and then you reached out and said, hey, there's some good content there. What, what do you think of this idea? Yeah. Um, and it reminds me that um, a lot of writers will reject themselves before they even get a chance to try something. So, you know, had you said, no, Mark's not, he's too busy. He's not going to want to work on this book. You would have rejected yourself without asking. So you reached out and asked. And then the other thing you did, and of course it, it boggles my mind that I don't think of these things, but uh, you, you reached out and said, you know, sent a copy of the book to Joanna Penn, one of the most magnificent influencers uh, for indie authors on the planet. And, and and I know Joe, we've been friends for a long, long time. It never once occurred to me to send her the book and say, hey, Joe, would you want to read this? And if, if, you, write, would, if you like it, could you give us a blurb? <laughs> but you did that and we got this amazing blurb. But again, it's almost like I self-rejected. I said, like, yeah, I'm not going to send it. Like I, I, or I didn't, it didn't occur to me. So yeah. well, I think that it could be self-rejecting, but it could be that I mean, you're very much a part of that world. I think that there's like the A-list of indie people. You're one, Joanna's one, Mark Dawson, Nick Stevenson, you know, that whole, uh, Zach Bohannon, Jay Thorne, that whole community. And if you're in that community, you might, if you're in that fleet, you might disregard the opportunities that it offers you. Whereas for me, it was like, ooh, you know, Mark LaFave, Joanna Penn, you know, it's, it was always there as a bucket list item for me. And so it's not discounting things just because they're close to you. Right, right. 
Well, I will graciously accept that compliment to be to stand among those giants that you mentioned. <laughs> that you yeah, mentioned. you should. That is fantastic. Now we're getting uh, to the part of the episode uh, where we're going to take some comments from the floor, questions from the floor. And the first question I'm gonna pop up on the screen is from Lisa. And uh, Lisa says, uh, question, what's the best piece of writing advice that you would give uh, to beginning writers? Well, I'm totally going to crib off an episode of the Indie Author Podcast that is going to be going out on Tuesday. I can't calculate it. If somebody Tuesday can... the 9th, June 9th? Tuesday the 9th, I believe, okay. yeah. <laughs> With um, Emma Syme, and this is especially appropriate because Lisa was the person who suggested Emma as uh, a guest for the Indie Author Podcast. And Emma has a whole philosophy called Question the Premise, which is that you shouldn't just take any kind of advice, whether it's about writing anything. You shouldn't just take it and act on it blindly. She describes it much better than I do, so please listen to the episode so you can hear her talk about it directly. But I'm stealing from her a little bit by saying that I don't know that there's one piece of best advice other than question the advice you're hearing. So an example that that we talked about, um, I'm sorry, I think I've been saying Emma, I should be saying Becca. Becca. Yeah, Becca, sorry, thank I was just you. myself, I was like, it sounds close. Just <laughs> fix that in the recording. We'll go back and do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, I was, I had just edited a, the, an episode with someone named Emma, so that's, <laughs> that's my excuse. Anyhow, if you listen to Becca, um, the example that we talked about was um, you can't edit a blank page. So this advice that you have to get something down on the page in order to work on it. And the fact that that's great advice for some people and it's terrible advice for other people. And I'm one of those people that is terrible advice for. So the way I write is I tend to think about, um, I draft a lot in my head. And so by the time I sit down to a keyboard to write something out, I've worked through it a lot in my head. And by the time I get it out on the page, it's pretty clean. And if I were, as Becca says, um, encouraged to just vomit the words out onto the page because you can't edit a blank page, then that would freak me out. And it would freak me out in part because I kind of have this mindset that once, once the words are on the page, it's not merely raw material that I could do anything with. It's a little bit set. And so my fear is if I put something really bad on the page that I'm gonna be stuck with something really bad and I'm never gonna be able to go back and fix it. So my advice would be try these things. If they, if they feel that they make sense for you, try them, but don't feel like you're failing if they don't work for you. Just realize that it's probably, um, it's probably not right for how your brain works. And another one for me was dictation. You know, everybody says, whoa, dictation, because you can, you know, write a book in a week and a half. <laughs> but to me, you know, I went out and I got the little micro recorder and I would take it on my walks and every once in a while I'd take it out and say, don't forget to pick up milk at the store. You know, because it just wasn't like dictating a story wasn't natural for me. Right. And I recognize that some people fail at dictation because they don't try it for long enough. But I think some people... For some people, it's just not right, and right. so keep that in mind as you're as you're heeding the advice of uh, of your heroes in the writing world and assess both whether it's good advice and whether it's good advice for you. Well, I mean, I, I could even say that uh, the the implements for writing may be different. Some people prefer uh, a laptop, computer, keyboard with no internet connection. You know, thinking about digital minimalism and stuff like that. Yeah. Was that? Uh, some people would prefer uh, writing in a journal, handwriting their first draft in a journal because because for them, that's how they channel their energy into it. Some people uh, dictate, while other people, I, I've even heard, um, love the old typewriter writers because of the, the meaty sort of clunkiness and in the, in the uh, it feels like you're, you're really um, interacting physically in a different way. And, and, and it's always like you're announcing to the world with each keystroke, it's ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Yeah. And you know, having grown up on that, uh, there is a satisfaction in, uh, because you actually see a blank page. 
Mm -hmm. And then it's not blank as opposed yeah. to a scrolling thing on a screen uh, or whatever. So I think it's really valuable for writers to um, question the advice on how they should write. And then, as, as you suggest, focus on how you best write, what works for you and, and kind of go with it. You know, and it could even be, oh, I listen to music or I can't listen to anything or I need a crowded cafe or no, I, I, I get too distracted. I need to be facing the wall. Um, yeah. Another piece of advice like that, that totally makes sense to me, but didn't work for me was printing out your draft for an edit. Okay. So, you know, lots of people say you finish maybe your first or second draft. And if you're working on a computer and then you print it out and there's that benefit of seeing it in a, an entirely different format that you haven't seen it before. But what I found just to demonstrate my OCD issues is I would print it all out, I would sit down, I would mark up the first page, and then the first page was messy looking, you know? So I would go reprint the first page. Oh no, just like just like in your writing process early on. <laughs> yeah, and, and then of course, you know, because I'd edited it, the end of the first page didn't match the beginning of the second page. So then I had, I had to fight this urge to just reprint the whole, you know, 400 pages of it or whatever, which was ridiculous. But I haven't printed out a copy of my books for probably after the first couple because it was just not useful for me. But I have heard people say things like, and, and this has worked for me, change the font that you're looking at it in. Because oh. even that small change can enable you to see it in a slightly fresher light. You know, so you can not only save yourself aggravation, but you can save yourself um, hundreds of dollars of toner cartridge um, ink <laughs> if you if you assess whether these things are right for you or not. I uh, I know you're working on an audiobook. I know you're doing the audiobook for taking the short time. I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of that as well. But I would propose because this worked like this for me is reading my book aloud. Yes. Was a really amazing way to find all kinds of errors that yeah. none of the edits and passes and the multiple eyeballs spotted. I mean, yeah. even after a book has been published, I'm reading the book aloud going, how come nobody noticed this? Yeah. Did you, did you find the same thing? Like, actually, that actually is a great way to proofread. I do. I, that's a great way not only to proofread, but just to also find things like if you're overusing some authorial tick, like everybody sighs. I have people sigh way too often if I don't catch it. <sighs> <laughs> um, but the other thing, and this is something that Joanna Penn talks a lot about, about writing for audio. And I didn't really understand what she meant until I started trying to <laughs> narrate uh, taking the short tack and even doing the podcasts. And the best example recently was I had Kelly Simmons on the podcast and she was doing a giveaway of her book. And the book is called How to Write a Great Freak, <laughs> you see the problem, a great freaking query letter. <laughs> and so I had to I had to record a thing that said, Kelly's giving away a copy of her book, How to Write a Great Freaking Query Letter. And then I had to go back and edit out the pauses because I couldn't say those words all together. <laughs> and I must have spent, no kidding, 20 minutes trying to record like a 15 second blurb telling people that they had a chance to win Kelly's book. Um, Kelly's free, great book. <laughs> great book. Also frequent rewards is a tough one. Frequent I, I, can't, I think that was from taking the short tag. And I thought I'm never going to write frequent rewards again, because I know that if I have to narrate it, it's going to be disastrous. That sounds like it could be the title of one of your next short stories. <laughs> frequent <laughs> rewards. <laughs> it is kind of funny how you get uh, hung up on those. I was working with an author last year who did a nonfiction book. Now she happens to be a professional speaker and she worked with a brilliant editor, got her book polished completely. The print book was out, the uh, um, the ebook was out. And then she went to record the audiobook. So she rented a studio where the professional producer and everything. And what she found because she's a professional speaker and used to talking off the cuff, she didn't just stick to the script. She just kind of rolled with it and kind of went in her own direction. So her audiobook of The Flip Side of Failure is actually unique in that it's the same chapter on the same topic, but she kind of approaches it a little bit different. And, and I don't think it was kind of funny because I, I was listening to it and then I had a copy of the book and I was looking at it and the changes adapted well for the format. It was almost like a movie adaptation of a book where, yeah, it, that wouldn't work in a movie, 
so we had to change it. Yeah. Do you think that's that's applicable in, in a case like that? Or do you, are you a purist when it comes to the words have to match exactly? I can't imagine if you're narrating your own audiobook, obviously you have the right to change it. I don't see anything wrong with that. I also like that more informal rendition when authors are reading their own nonfiction books so that they're not reading it, they're sort of performing it, they're being more extemporaneous like you're describing. I'm also thinking that a good way you could use that learning is before you publish the book, pretend like you're doing the audiobook or actually do the audiobook and you might surface content or even an approach that you hadn't thought of when you were just sitting at your computer writing. So you could use it both as a kind of an editorial tool and as a reader outreach tool. Oh, that, that is that is cool. I like that. So uh, we just uh, just a few minutes before we wrap up. If there's any other questions, feel free to pop them into the comments so we can address them. But I'm going to keep plugging away with my own questions, if that's sure. okay. So uh, I have to ask, uh, what are you working on next? Because you're doing nonfiction, you got the podcast going on, you got that branding, and then you've got fiction. Who do you who do you please next? What's the next thing that you're going to be releasing? Well, I'm getting very close to finishing the first draft of the next Anne Kinnear book, and I'm planning to have that out later this year. I'm waiting to get the cover art back because I finally picked the title. Uh, go to my Facebook page or subscribe to my email newsletter if you want to get early notification of what the title is. And I'm also rebranding the sense of death and the sense of reckoning because although I love the covers of those books, the sense of death especially, if you if you see an early version of that, the cover is gorgeous. It's this photograph of, a, of an old door with a, a brass door knocker in the shape of a hand and the you know the keyhole and the paint on it was gorgeous it was obviously layers and layers of paint it was this really vibrant kind of chocolatey brown color with like little bits of red in it it was really a, it was a gorgeous picture and um i bought it on shutterstock or something like that and the early print covers of that did a great rendition, you know, it represented that photograph really accurately. And then they must have changed the technical specs for covers because I started getting messages that that the colors were too saturated or something like that. I can't remember what the terminology was. And I went back to a designer and I had them like dumb it down. And by the time it was acceptable, it was just not a good looking cover. It was very washed out, kind of had this unpleasant yellowish tinge. And I was able to get another cover designer who was able to fix it a little bit, but never back to the gorgeous original. And so I had always wanted, ever since I ran into that problem, I'd always wanted to get the cover redone in a way that looked professional and nice and attractive. And so um, I'm in the process of waiting for that, which is gonna be very exciting. It's always exciting to see the cover of a book. So you're doing, you're rebranding re the entire series then based on the, the new no, Star Wars? I'm, just just a matter of doing the redoing the covers. Okay. And um, so that's taking a lot of my time. The podcast is taking a huge amount of time. And I feel like I'm just now getting to the point where I've sort of refined all my processes to the point that I'm not spending. I mean, I do it once a week, so I can't be spending four days on the podcast. Is that how it was at the beginning? Like the learning curve? Yeah, it was a steep learning curve. And I'm finally getting to the point where I can process a podcast in about two solid days, which is still longer than I want to spend, but at least it's better than it was. <laughs> because uh, in part because I do a lot of audio editing, right. like I would edit out all that embarrassing getting the name wrong thing that I had done earlier. <laughs> so, but I'm starting to get to the point where that's getting to be a little more efficient. I am have Mark. I must admit, have been neglecting the audiobook recording because I ran into some technical difficulties. But I think I've gotten those resolved. So I'm, um, I'm getting back to that. But a lot of those things I talked about earlier, like the idea of finding your fleet, the idea of building community, is what I would really like to have my next nonfiction book be. 
And I'm thinking of it as three chapter or three sections. One would be building community with other writers. One would be building community with readers once you're published. And one would be building community with people in the publishing and writing worlds outside those two groups. Right. And weaving the nautical metaphor through the whole thing. Naturally. Um, and then the, the concept of uh, creating your craft, which would be how one can apply nautical metaphors to the writing craft. And in support of that, I have always wanted to build a boat myself. And when I was working my corporate job, I had the money, but not the time to sign up for class to learn to do that. And now I don't have the money or the time. Um, but I'm watching this great series of videos called Acorn to Arabella, which is about these two guys. I'm just starting out, but they decided they wanted to build uh, from scratch. And from scratch, I mean like felling the trees. They wanted to build a, a sailboat and sail around the world. And so I'm watching those videos now. I'm just watching the ones where they're felling the trees right? and saying, yeah, yeah, that's like whatever. Um, but I would love to have another thing that's on my plate is this creating your craft type of book about uh, the writing craft and what I've learned there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Maddie, thank you so much for sharing about the writing craft and the business of writing. Where can people find you online? At MaddieDowernbull.com, as you can see there. And I like to say Maddie with a Y, M-A-T-T-Y, if anyone is listening but not looking. And also at the indieauthor.com, and that is indie with a Y, I-N-D-Y. So those are the two best places to go for information about me and, and links to other places like Facebook, which is where the social media platform I'm most active on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maddie. Uh, it was great having you here. It was fun to be here, Mark. Thank you so much.